Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Over the past week or so, I've made a video on the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid and also two videos on more possible hidden chambers and corridors below it. I've never really focused on this part of the pyramid before, but I'm finding the subject by far the most interesting aspect of this incredible ancient structure. I'm focusing on this area mainly because of the words of Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian who has recently proven right about the lost city of Thonis Heracleion. So could he be right about Khufu being laid to rest on a small island surrounded by water beneath the Great Pyramid? I think it's possible, and in my opinion, the information in this video is my most compelling yet. I am seeing a lot of comments with people saying that Khufu didn't build the pyramid and it's certainly not his tomb. But I'm not concerning myself with who built the pyramid, how old it is, or even its primary function. I'm just looking at whether Khufu was buried below the structure. Whether he built it, or whether it was already there, the fact is that this structure was associated with Khufu. His family are buried around it. I believe that in the Old Kingdom, Giza was known as Akek Khufu, and the kings of the Sate period noted his connection to Giza on the inventory stealer. Whether we like it or not, Khufu is connected to the Great Pyramid. And whether he built it or not, he may still have wanted to be buried below the most incredible structure in Egypt, if not the world. But what I can't get my head around is if Khufu was planning to be buried below the pyramid, what kind of funeral would he have, with men wedging themselves into the descending passageway, dragging the body of the king down the inclined shaft, where risk of slipping and dropping him was very possible. Then they'd reach a crude man-made shaft, tie a rope around his remains before taking him down to his tomb, where there were further risks of dropping him. Maybe there are more sloping corridors that go further down, but even if there are, it doesn't seem like a funeral fit for a king. It feels awkward and unlikely. Logically, there has to be another way down, and I actually think there is a very obvious route we are all overlooking. Something now lost in a book by Jean Carousel that was written more than 15 years ago. His work needs to be made public again, and I'm more than happy to do so. If Khufu is buried below the pyramid, his body would be around 40 metres below its base, which is a huge number, around 131 feet into the bedrock. For the ancient workers, getting to this position below the Great Pyramid is surely an incredibly difficult and painstaking task, working in tight corridors with little air and light, with many dangers and hazards all around. It feels so difficult that it feels improbable. What people forget is that the Great Pyramid is built onto a plateau, on its northeastern edge, an area of fairly level high ground, higher than the valley to the east and northeast. But how much higher is the plateau? Now everything gets very interesting. Just 100 metres to the northeast of the Great Pyramid, that's less than the distance between the Great Pyramid and the Khafre Pyramid, you find yourself 45 metres lower than the pyramid's base. Keep walking towards the northeast, and you keep going lower and lower. You're at approximately the same elevation as if you were stood inside the Sphinx enclosure, but you would have been more than twice as close to the Great Pyramid. Therefore, to get inside the bedrock below the Great Pyramid, some 40 metres below its base, you only had to burrow a straight tunnel through soft limestone for 100 metres from the northeast, which is arguably one of the easiest construction projects on the Giza Plateau. The Great Pyramid's descending passageway is in itself 91 metres in length, and that was built at an inclined angle, a far harder job than a straight tunnel in the open air. And there is a reason why this very probably did happen, and now I'll explain why. There is a huge amount of evidence in the archaeological and historical record that throughout the dynasties of ancient Egypt, from Memphis to Giza and beyond, northern Egypt was full of man-made canals. Canals that were engineered in such a way that the water inside them was above the natural bedrock water table. 
These canals or slipways were created primarily for navigational purposes, to help the people tackle the difficult problem of getting past the cataracts on the Nile, to avoid the dangerous currents. They would often run parallel to the river. Researcher Jean Vacuta found the remains of one of these slipways bordering the second cataract at Mergesa, structures that were reused during the Middle Ages. We know they existed because they were mentioned by the ancient historian Diodorus. He said there was a toll to pay when you reached each gnome, probably all the way up to the Mediterranean Sea. The biggest and longest slipway was between Memphis and the Great Pyramid, and we know that two boats were able to pass at the same time. From an opening in the Nile Embankment further south, boats of all size, after lowering their sails, would enter the Link Canal. This canal of calm water would have been a magnificent waterway and large enough for big boats or boats tied together to carry large blocks of stone for building work. This waterway would have been used by Mira, the man whose diary was discovered, that talks about taking stone to Aket Khufu. It would only take Khufu a few hours to sail from Memphis to the port of the Pyramid, in a light skiff manned by the king's own rowers. The pyramid texts also state, the king sails on his canal, and also, you sail on your canal like Ra along the pathways of the firmament. Herodotus even said, when the Nile overflows, the whole country is converted into a sea, and towns alone remain above water. At these times, water transport is used all over the country instead of merely along the course of the river and anyone going from Norcratis to Memphis would pass right by the pyramids. So, here is evidence that a canal passed right by the pyramids. But what has all this got to do with Khufu's tomb beneath the Great Pyramid? Well, as noted by Diodorus, the Egyptians spent more time preparing their eternal resting places than in arranging their own homes. He said, the inhabitants of the country attach no importance to the time they spend in this life, but are greatly concerned about the time that, after their death, will perpetuate their meritorious deeds. We know that Herodotus speaks of the underground passages and chambers in the hill on which the pyramid stands, and that the king made these chambers for his tomb, and in order that they could be on an island, he brought water from the Nile by means of a channel. Generally speaking, Egyptologists do not believe these claims, believing it to be a misinterpretation of a myth. Experts claim that the king's chamber was Khufu's final resting place, but as we all know, there is no evidence, and therefore I do think we should all be taking Herodotus more seriously. Experts say that Khufu's tomb could only be excavated above the water table. You can't quarry if the rock is submerged. And yes, everyone agrees with this. But if that's the case, how could the tomb contain the moat of water, which Herodotus specifically states was connected to the Nile? At Giza, the river Nile is lower than the water table. If they added the water manually, limestone bedrock won't hold water for long, because it's naturally soft and permeable, riddled with cavities and fissures any water would filter down to the water table, and then run down towards the Nile. This is why we are told that Herodotus was wrong. The chamber would need a constant source of water. But the experts have not taken into account the canal by the side of the Great Pyramid, a canal which had the same level of water as the Nile when it forks from the river further upstream. This means that at Giza, the canal's water level is higher than the Nile to the east. When this reach of canal got to the Great Pyramid, the level of water was well above the water table, which we know descended towards the Nile with a slight slope. Jean Carissel calculated that the water level of this canal would be 40 metres lower than the base of the Great Pyramid in Old Kingdom times. As stated, the natural water table was lower. So, the chamber mentioned by Herodotus could be carved in dry conditions. Then, when the work was done, a channel was cut connecting the canal by the side of the Great Pyramid with Khufu's tomb. This canal contained running water via its constant connection to the Nile further upstream, and so the water level inside the tomb would be constantly above the water table. If we are to believe the words of Herodotus, the chamber would have contained a raised platform or island. 
On the death of the king, water could be let in to surround the island. It is a relatively easy, yet very intelligent construction project. Now, instead of manhandling Khufu's remains down the descending passageway of the Great Pyramid, the king could have a true royal burial, with the royal barge bearing Khufu's sarcophagus sailing on the canal to the Great Pyramid, which forked off to his final resting place inside the bedrock. This idea does create an incredible image in one's mind. The level of the canal is something we can model, just as Carousel did, and, if correct, we know the exact place where Khufu was likely buried, directly below the apex of the Great Pyramid, 40 metres below ground. The limestone bedrock is easy to carve, and the waterways were already there. It would be the perfect burial for a king, and you don't even need to enter the Great Pyramid on the day of the funeral. The channel into the tomb would have been blocked up in time, concealed within the cliff face, but there would still be some connection to the canal outside. This meant that whilst the canal existed, Khufu would always be surrounded by water. So, what are the anomalies mentioned in the past two videos? All of the work that was done beneath the horizontal passageway in the subterranean chamber. Well, these can be interpreted in a number of ways. Firstly, the grave goods could have been brought into the pyramid and then taken down to Khufu's tomb accordingly, via these secret chambers. This could fool any tomb robbers into thinking you had to access the Great Pyramid to find the riches of the king. Secondly, the workers may have started excavating inside the pyramid when the huge cracks appeared, as mentioned in my previous video. This, together with harsh working conditions, meant the excavations inside the pyramid were abandoned, and so workers looked for a new way into the bedrock beneath the pyramid. Thirdly, the pyramid in its entirety was not the work of Khufu, and therefore all of the passages and chambers, including the subterranean chamber and descending passageway, are nothing to do with him. The fourth option may well be the most likely. As stated, the channel linking the tomb to the canal cannot be operational until the tomb is cut. You can't really quarry if the limestone bedrock is submerged. Therefore, maybe all of the preparation work was done first of all from beneath the subterranean chamber and horizontal passageway, and the final act was to connect his tomb with the canal. Khufu's tomb was very much like the Assyrian, which symbolised the primeval mound rising from the waters at the creation of the world. The Assyrian is in the area of Qom el Sultan, which also contains early dynastic mud brick structures. It was a main centre for the Court of Osiris, and what did Sir Flinders Petrie find here in 1903, very close to the Assyrian, the only known statuette of King Khufu. Is this just a mere coincidence? So, why can't we gain access to the chamber today? Well, we could if experts were looking in the right place. Somewhere around here, there should be a now blocked entrance into the bedrock of the Great Pyramid. Here's how the area looked in 1857, and you can see a huge amount of exposed bedrock. But here is the area around 20 years ago, now covered in a huge pile of rubble. I have no idea how it looks today, but I will take a look when I'm next in Egypt, which will hopefully be later this year. It is just manual labour to remove the rubble, and then one for geologists and archaeologists to find breaches into the bedrock, ones that don't look to be natural. Researcher Andrew Collins has shown that there are caves under the bedrock at Giza, and one of them I'm sure leads here, to the tomb of King Khufu, which would arguably be the greatest discovery of the 21st century. We can excavate into the hillside to the northeast of the pyramid, or we can simply drill a borehole and send down an endoscope from the subterranean chamber, which would be the easiest way. So, what are we waiting for? If Egypt does need a tourism driver, this would be it. If they don't find Khufu's tomb, they've lost nothing. A borehole can be filled in, like other restoration work inside the Great Pyramid. But discover the tomb of Pharaoh Khufu, and, well, how many people watching this video would like to enter the ancient cave 40 metres below the Great Pyramid and take a look at the ancient tomb of King Khufu with your own eyes? I for one certainly would. 
Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.